Our sermon text is in the Gospel of John, chapter 4. It's John chapter 4, verses 43 through 54. John 4, 43 through 54. After the two days, he departed for Galilee. Galilee. For Jesus himself had testified that a prophet has no honor in his own hometown. So when he came to Galilee, the Galileans welcomed him, having seen all that he had done in Jerusalem at the feast, for they too had gone to the feast. So he came again to Cana in Galilee, where he was, had made the water to wine. And at Capernaum, there was an official whose son was ill. When this man heard that Jesus had come from Judea to Galilee, he went to him and asked him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. So Jesus said to him, unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. The official said to him, sir, come down before my child dies. Jesus said to him, go, your son will live. The man believed the words that Jesus spoke to him and went on his way. As he was going down, his servants met him and told him that his son was recovering. So he asked them the hour when he began to get better. And they said to him, yesterday at the seventh hour, the fever left him. The father knew that the hour, that was the hour when Jesus said to him, your son will live. And he himself believed and all his household. This was now the second sign that Jesus did when he had come to, from Judea to Galilee. Let's pray. We praise you, God, uh, just for a morning that we can open your word, that we can study your word, that we can gather, uh, first of all, as your people, needy. Uh, we know our need. Uh, we know how uh, some of us gather here um, with needs that um, have been weighing us down this past week. Other of us, others of us have uh, gathered with a, a need of perhaps a cold heart to you, and we just, we just need to hear from you. We need to know that you are real and to know that you love us and care for us, and that trusting in you we will have all that we need. We pray, Lord God, that we would believe your word. So as we, as we hear your word and your word is proclaimed by your spirit, we pray that we would receive your word and trust it and trust whatever you say. Glorify yourself in this service, we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Today we come to a, an account of Jesus healing a, an official's son. Uh, this teaches us many important things about Jesus, uh, I believe. Uh, one thing it teaches us is that Jesus wants more for this man than physical healing of his son. Uh, we also see that uh, Jesus recognizes that there's things more essential than physical healing. Uh, we should all know that ourselves. There's something more essential in your life than a temporal physical blessing. Yet we also see in this text that Jesus is willing to give someone the lesser that is the less essential thing, like healing, while pushing him toward the better thing that he knows that we need. And in this, we see that Jesus is uh, full of power and grace and mercy. One of the most essential things that I think we want to focus our attention around in this service is uh, Jesus speaking, Jesus saying something, and him uh, meaning for himself to be believed. And this is the direction I want to push all of us today. Uh, Jesus is speaking. His word is full. Uh, this word is full of his words. Do you believe his words? Or do you doubt? Are you not so sure? Well, Jesus means to be believed. He's, he's not speaking for any other reason other than to be believed, to be trusted. And that's the direction I want to push, you, push us today. One of the things that we see in the first several verses is that Jesus ministered to those who were not most interested in what he came to give. We see this especially in verses 43 through 45, but it carries on to, into the next section. We see that Jesus here is, does, isn't honored, but he is in fact welcomed. And what are we supposed to make of that? Jesus is going uh, from a particular area. He had been uh, he started uh, chapter 2 in, in Galilee, but he had worked his way over to Samaria. And in Samaria, that's where we just, uh, where we left him last week. Uh, in chapter 4, Jesus has gone to Samaria. He's talked to this woman at the well. She believes. Lots of people believe. And so this, everything seems to be going great. And now Jesus is going to go back to Galilee. 
And uh, we wonder then what kind of reception is Jesus going to get when he goes back there. One of the things that uh, gets, uh, one of the verses that sh shows up in parentheses in some translations is verse 44, it says, for Jesus himself had testified that a prophet has no honor in his hometown. And the question is, uh, what's that a reference to here in the book of John? Uh, now, you, we probably know, you may know, Jesus came from Nazareth, which was an area, a part of Galilee. So Galilee is kind of a larger area, and one of the areas inside of Galilee is, is Nazareth. And so some people say, well, Jesus, he goes to get the greater Galilee area, but he doesn't go directly back to Nazareth. And that's probably true. Uh, and that's perhaps, perhaps that's the best way to understand this. He, he's going to, you know, we, we might say if a, if, a, if a guy grew up here and went off to college in another state, he's going to come back to North Carolina, but he's not going to hang out in Wake Forest. And maybe that's the right way to understand this. He's coming back to the greater area, but he's not coming back to the, uh, the town. And some people think that's right, although the interesting thing here is there's no mention of Gal or Nazareth in this section. It shows up in chapter 1, can anything good come from Nazareth? But it has, it's been a few chapters since we talked about Nazareth, so is Nazareth the right way to understand it? Some people actually think the better way to think about it is that here, the hometown is the, is the broader area. That is, Jesus grew up, yes, in Nazareth, but in the greater Galilee area. And so they suspect that maybe really what's going on here is the idea that Jesus doesn't really have a lot of honor in the greater Galilee area. So now, if, if that's the right way to understand it, then we basically have Jesus leaving Samaria where lots of people believed and going to a place where people are not as receptive to Jesus. And then you might say, well, okay, that, that, that could be the understanding. Maybe that's the right way to understand it. Um, but the interesting thing that we see here is that people are, in fact, welcoming Jesus. Uh, they're welcoming him. And then we might ask, well, why are they welcoming Jesus? This is an important question for us to answer. People are welcoming him. And uh, one of the things, though, that we see, though, and I think this is an important way to understand our text, is that he's being honored not for, in a sense, what he means to be honored for. He's being honored for what he can do for people. Right? G Jesus has amazing powers. He can come and he can... He can heal people, right? He can, he can take water and turn it into wine. He can do amazing things. And people are like, hey, there's the guy who can heal people. Bring him in. And, and we, one question we might want to ask ourselves is, is that honoring the one who came as the Messiah to say, we're not really interested in you being the Messiah, but if you can take our water and make it wine, come on in. Is, is that honoring to him? And I, and I want to suggest that perhaps... It's a way to be welcoming to him, but perhaps not honoring him because he came, again, not just to take water and make it wine. He came mainly to save people from their sins. Central to Jesus' message is that aspect, isn't it? He's the Savior of sinners. And again, we just want to ask ourselves today, as we have lots of people who are interested in Jesus, who can come in and fix their failed marriages and, and, and we think he can do this sort of work, by the way. Uh, he, he can do all kinds of amazing things. But some people are slower to come to him as the only one who can save them from their sins. And so we, we, we come to that point. Why did Jesus come? And again, I... I, I, I Submit to you that, that I think marriages are stronger. Uh, you, you, your life is, is better. There, there's many ways in which we can benefit from the Lord's ministry. And yet the Lord came specifically for the salvation of your soul. Well, anyway, Jesus has already spoken to the woman at the well. This is just picking up from chapter 4 here. He told the woman at the well, or the woman at the well rather says to him in verses 25 and 26, I know that Messiah is coming. Right? And when he comes, he'll tell us all things. And Jesus, is, uh, Jesus says, I am him. I am Messiah. So Jesus basically is trying to be clear to this woman, I am the one who has come as Savior. And people do believe that he is the Savior of the world. And this is uh, what, Jesus, uh, what Jesus wanted people to believe. By the but it's not true that in Galilee he was broadly accepted as a Savior. At least not yet. Right? He goes back to Galilee... And even though in Samaria people had accepted him and, and they had said, we believe that you are the Savior of the world, that's what they said in chapter 4, verse 42, 
uh, we know in Galilee, not everybody's believing him, in him as Savior of the world. As a matter of fact, we, if we fast forward all the way to chapter 7, verse 5, we see that not even his brothers believed in him. Now, that's kind of a big setup, but it's a setup to basically say maybe Jesus is going to a place where he really wasn't welcomed for who he really was. He's going back from a place where he was being accepted in Samaria, and now he's going to a place where he doesn't really have the honor that he's looking for, the honor as of the promised Messiah. Well, Jesus, of course, is one who does amazing things, right? He, he is... Um, Many people are uh, rejecting him. Uh, that's what we've seen in Jesus' life. People have been rejecting him. And yet some people are believing in him. It says in chapter 1, verse, verse 11, it says, He came to his own and his own people didn't receive him. So we know some people don't receive him. And then he says, well, some people did receive him. Just the very next verse, verses 12 and 13. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God who were born not of, the, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So one of the things that I'm trying to get at here is that Jesus is receiving a reception, but not the kind of the reception that he was wanting, right? He's getting a mixed reception. Just because people are happy that Jesus comes doesn't mean they're honoring him the way he means to be honored. He came not to be rejected, to be rejected as the Messiah, but to be accepted as the, as the Messiah, and it's really, honestly, the, the, the honoring of him turns on whether or not you believe, not just that he can take a blind person and, and give them sight, or that he can take water and make it into wine, right? Again, many people come to Jesus in this way, but Jesus is saying the, the receiving of him is whether or not you accept him and you receive him as the only one who can wash away your sins. And that's, that's the way, by the way, again, in, in our own culture where we, we need to press on people, People want to say nice things about Jesus, and yet Jesus is not just uh, one of those folks that you can just uh, have him come in and fix the bad things in your life that aren't right and then reject him as Savior and Lord. Uh, he means to only come to be the one who washes away our sins, who saves us uh, through his death on the cross. Well, uh, I need to move on, but uh, the question for us again is, uh, how do we look at Jesus, and do we accept Jesus any better uh, than he, these folks in Galilee did? Uh, and I hope that we do. I hope that we see, though, in this text that Jesus is both coming to be honored, but not being honored in the way he meant to be honored. I need to move on to the next section, though, which is verses 46 through 50. The verses 46 through 50, we see that Jesus graciously gave what was wanted though the man had a greater need. Now, what, I mean, what we mean to say here then is that Jesus, if, we, if we're right that Jesus basically came to give salvation, and, but this guy comes to Jesus and all he wants is his son healed. Now, by the way, I say all he wants is his son healed. That's not the kind of thing that you or I can do, right? I, I can't, if somebody's uh, son is near death, I'm not going to be able to make that son live for another 10, 20, 30 years, right? So, so I... I understand that when I say he just is able to make the son live, that's, that's still a very, very big thing. But, but this man is coming to Jesus not because he says, I know this is the Messiah. He isn't coming to Jesus as Jesus the Messiah. He's coming to Jesus as the one who can take and, and take care of this, this temporal need, this son near death. So, so the request, uh, there, again, there's no indication then that this man is coming to Jesus to uh, trust him as the Messiah. He came because he's desperate. And we just see it here in the text. Let me just read a few verses to us. When this man heard that Jesus had come from Judea to Galilee, he went to him and asked him to come down and to heal his son. Right? So this guy is just desperate. And the, the next phrase says, because he was at the point of death. So the son's about to die. And this guy, again, completely not really interested in whether or not Jesus is the Christ. He just... My son's going to die, and I'm going to do anything it takes to make my son live, right? So he comes and he begs Jesus. Jesus, can you, can you uh, heal my son? Would you come heal my son? And he actually says, come heal my son, because he seems to think that Jesus is going to need to travel to his hometown to do it. This, this guy has traveled a long distance, and he says, why don't you come home with me? And if you come home with me, you can make my son live. That's the situation here. And... Um, 
I, I just want to suggest to us, though, by the way, that it is nice that one believes that Jesus can make one's physical life better, but Jesus, again, came for his eternal soul, didn't he? Now, you might think that Jesus is then going to say, well, I didn't come for physical life. I came for eternal souls. I'm not going to do anything for you. Yet Jesus actually still is happy to meet this request, isn't he? Right? He came for eternal souls, but he does, in fact, he has the power. He's able to temporarily save this boy's life. And he's, in fact, willing to do it. And this is where we, again, when we said at the beginning of this section, Jesus graciously gives what this guy wanted, even though Jesus knows that this son, if he lives another 30 or 40 or 50 years, if he dies without a Savior, his eternity is still going to be not a pleasant one. Right? So Jesus, but Jesus is still willing to extend this son's life. But we do also see that Jesus finds fault with this. Jesus finds fault with the request that he's getting. And he says in verse 48, Jesus said to him, unless you see the signs and wonders, you will not believe. Jesus says to him, unless you, unless you see a miracle, you're not going to believe. You, you've just come for the miracles. And Jesus has found this fault in other places too. Right? Jesus finds fault with this focus on miracles. In John 6, 26, he says this. This is after they had come for the feeding of the 5,000. Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. So what we see in this section then, in what Jesus is criticizing in John chapter 6, is basically saying, you've come to me not because you think that I'm the Messiah, but because you think you can get a free meal. And again, we see Jesus, again, criticizing people on legitimate grounds. Jesus is not mainly here so that you can have a full belly. Now, he can take care of your empty belly, and he may well do it. But he's not mainly the sort of, uh, he didn't mainly come just so your belly can be full. Right? But what he doesn't do is he says, well, you need your soul saved, and you don't need any food. And he says, so I'm not going to give you any. He's happy, again, to meet these temporal needs, but he's always wanting to point people beyond, again, I can make your life better, I can fix your marriage, I can do, I, he can do these things, right? But he's just trying to point them beyond that to something more important, something more eternal, the salvation, the eternal salvation of their souls. So again, when we see Jesus here saying to them, unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe, he's... he's a little bit impatient with those who come to him just for signs and wonders, yet... Uh, he's, not, he's not unwilling uh, to meet these temporal needs. He's actually willing to meet these needs. But it is also true that when Jesus has people come to him just for physical needs, these are the sorts of people he doesn't entrust himself to. Remember in chapter 2, whenever he uh, cleansed the temple, right? And, uh, and then it says in chapter 2, verses 23 through 25, Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs that he, he had been doing. Jesus had already made water into wine. They'd seen him do miracle, miraculous things. And he's like, these people are believing. And he's like, but I'm not going to entrust myself to them. The sort of people that come after me just for getting their bellies filled, just for getting wine when they have water, those sorts of people I'm not going to entrust myself to. He recognizes that there's sort of a belief, we might just say a sort of a belief, that perhaps falls short of saving faith. It's a believing that Jesus can do, meets lots of temporal needs, and Jesus says, well, I'm not going to entrust myself to those sorts of people. Right? So again, many had believed in his name when they saw the signs that he was doing, but Jesus on his part did not entrust himself to them because he knew all people and needed no one to bear witness about man for he himself knew what was in man. Now one of the reasons why Jesus was not as excited about the people who just came for the miracles as he knew that if you just see a miracle, this won't save your soul. If you just see Jesus do a miracle and you're like, I'm just, I'm just here for Jesus because I know he raised Lazarus from the dead, let's say. Well, that's not the same thing as salvation. As a matter of fact, in the story of Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead in John 11... It says, many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what he did, that is, raised Jesus from the dead, believed in him, 
But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. And so Jesus can see then that just because you see him do something amazing, doesn't, that doesn't make you a Christian. Just because you believe that Jesus can do amazing things, that does not make you a Christian. Now, let's, let's, be, let's be clear. Those who are Christians do believe he can do amazing things. But being a Christian is not limited to or mainly defined by just believing that he does amazing things. So what Jesus is doing then in his life and in his ministry is trying to move people from, yes, believing that he can do amazing things, to moving them to the place of saving faith, that is, trusting in him for the forgiveness of their sins. So, but, so Jesus, in a sense, rebukes a little bit. I don't think he's just rebuking this man. I think he's pushing against the people of Galilee who just want to see Jesus do amazing things. In verse 45, again, I, don't, I, don't, I think Jesus is pushing back against the Galilean people. Unless you see the signs and wonders, you won't believe. He pushes back against them. And th yet, this man, uh, the, the one who wants his son to be healed, he's not deterred by this. Right? He just keeps pressing. <laughs> he's like, okay, I hear your complaint. I still am just begging you. Can you heal my son? Can you come and heal my son? So he keeps pressing. And again, we're, we're just reminded he, he, he mainly came uh, for that reason. And, and we're, now we're wondering, is Jesus going to say, no, I want your eternal soul. I don't, I'm not mainly here for healing people. Do you think Jesus is not going to do it? And again, I think the amazing thing is Jesus doesn't have to heal this son. And Jesus came for doing more than just healing the son. And yet Jesus will, in fact, heal the son. It's just an amazing, I think it's an amazing aspect of, of Jesus' grace and his kindness and his mercy, right? He gives them the lesser thing. And again, when we think of raising, uh, extending the life of a child, you don't think that that's a less thing, a small thing. No, it's a big thing. But again, it's not as important as his eternal soul. And yet Jesus is willing to give this lesser thing. So let's see how this plays out, though, because I think it's instructive. The, the official then is not deterred, right? He says, Jesus, I want you to come. That's what he says in verse 49. Please, please come. Sir, come down before my child dies. So he's begging this. He's begging Jesus. Look, my child is going to die. Come right now, please. And Jesus says to the man in verse 50, go, your son will live. So the, so the man has come at a distance to see Jesus perhaps uh, half a day or a day's journey to see Jesus. He's traveled a long way to see Jesus. He's come all that way only for his son to live. And Jesus says, okay, that's fine. Your son will live. And it's an amazing word that Jesus speaks there. But I think actually we ought to marvel at the faith of the man because the very next words say, the man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and went on his way. Now again, if I had traveled a day's walk <laughs> to see Jesus... And then I said, please come, because I thought he'd need to show up to heal my son. And the only reason I showed up is because I don't want my son to die. And Jesus just says, that's fine, he's going to be fine. To walk away actually is a huge act of faith. You have to believe. I actually thought you needed to show up, but you can just do it from a distance. I thought maybe you'd need to like lay hands on him or something. But you can just talk. You can just talk from miles away, and my son will be fine? I believe that. See, the only way this man can leave uh, satisfied is if he really believes that Jesus can do what he said he could do. And, of course, the man does believe what, that Jesus can say, uh, do what he said he could do, right? This man completely trusted Jesus, this man can only live in peace if he believes that Jesus can heal at this distance with just his words. And that's ex exactly what this man believes. He, the scriptures describes, not that he gave up hope. It isn't Jesus said, go home, your son's going to be fine. And the guy's like, forget it, I give up, I'm going to go home. He doesn't forget it, I give up, I'm going to go home. No, I believe. You can do it. And so we see, I think, significant and amazing faith from this man, trusting this is a bit of our theme here. Do you believe everything that Jesus says? He, he believed what Jesus said. Jesus said it, he believed it. And I think that serves as a good model for us. Do we believe the words that Jesus says? says? Jesus, of course, meant to be believed. 
He, he calls for belief that couldn't be seen. It would have even been nice. It would have been nicer for this, this man who came all this distance for Jesus to say uh, he, that Jesus would just do a quick miracle here. You know, if Jesus could say, okay, I'm going to heal your son. Hey, watch, I'll heal this guy, and that way you'll know I can heal your... Like, the guy didn't get to see Jesus do a miracle. Right? Jesus doesn't do a miracle in the presence of this guy, so far as we can tell. He just says, believe my words, and Jesus, and, and the man believes. So the man believes, again, without a sign. He doesn't see any sign at all. He just hears Jesus' words and believes it. And again, in truth, I want to remind us that Jesus wanted a different belief from this man than just that Jesus could work wonders. Jesus wants this guy's soul saved, and yet he's perfectly willing to say, okay, I will give you uh, what you want. Your son's health will be restored. So we see the grace of Jesus working in, the work, in, the, uh, in this wonder of healing. And we must believe, by the way, whatever Jesus says. Jesus uh, moves to push those who come to him all the way to believe in every word he says, especially the testimony that he's the Savior of the world. This is where we're, I think, I think where this text is heading. Jesus is not, in a sense, going to be satisfied with this man merely believing uh, that Jesus can heal the Son. I think we will find this man progress as we move to the next section. That's what we're going to do right now. So now let's turn our attention to verses 51 through 54. I think we see this man's faith believe... Uh, or, or rather we would say that faith believes every word of Jesus and this faith grows and spreads. One of the interesting things that we see happening then is that this man, again, he just, Jesus says, go home, your son's going to be fine. And this guy's like, okay, let's go home. And so they walk home. And, uh, and the report comes to the man as he's walking home, this is verse 51, as he was going down, his servants met him and told him that his son was recovering. So he hears the word, okay, Jesus, I've got a confirmation, Jesus' word was right, it was true. Verse 52 says, so he asked them the hour when he began to get better, and they said to him, yesterday at the seventh hour, the fever left him. And the father knew that that was the hour when Jesus had said to him, your son will live. So basically, now he has confirmation that the mo when did my son start getting better? Yesterday, seventh hour. Oh, well, that's when Jesus told me my son would live. So he has confirmation that the healing happened, and it happened exactly the moment Jesus said that the, the boy would recover. And so he has confirmation Right? So this man believed. We actually hear in verse, not just, not just if we read verse 53, we learn the father, uh, not only did he know this is the hour that Jesus said he would live, he himself believed in all his household. Of course, this is a common thing we sometimes hear in the New Testament. Sometimes a faith from a father or a faith of someone oftentimes can lead to the faith of those in the household. And that comes up many times in the book of Acts. Uh, Acts 16.31, remember that, uh, that jailer? Uh, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you will be saved, you and your household. And so sometimes faith happens like that, where the faith of one leads to the belief of others in the household as well. Acts eleven fourteen, we see something similar. He will declare to you a message by which you will be saved, you and all your household. And so, so we see, though, that fa this faith is spreading. But the question becomes, is the faith... So we, we see faith or belief two places in this passage. Uh, we see it... In verse 50, the man believed the word that Jesus had spoken. And then we see it again in verse 53, and he himself believed. And we're trying to, now we want to ask ourselves, is that the same belief? Is that just a repeating? You know, he believed in verse 50, then he walked home, and then he saw his son, and he believed again. Is that just the same belief, or do we think that's, a, that's an advancement? It's a, it's a greater bit of belief. And I think it's an advancement. I don't think he's just saying he believed him before he saw his son, and he believed him afterwards. I think... He believed him before he saw his son, then he saw his son, and he believed. And there's a sense in which the, we see now the belief strengthening, right? A stronger faith, having, having trusted, taken Jesus at his word, trusted Jesus, even though he, he didn't have any sign, he didn't have any affirmation, he didn't have any other reason other than he just decided to believe in Jesus. And then he believed Jesus, Jesus showed himself trustworthy, and he came out of that with stronger faith. And by the way, I think that's the way it's supposed to work in our lives as well. We believe him. And maybe we don't know everything we need to know. We just believe him. 
right? And I, I propose to you as one, one of the themes we're trying to work on here today is our own trust. Do, do you believe the words that Jesus say, says? Do you believe his words? Will you trust them? Sometimes he says things to you that you're not even sure you can understand or that you could possibly believe. I, I mean, I know he says that this is the way it works, but I'm not sure I can trust him. Will you believe him anyway? That's what this man did, right? It didn't make sense. I, you're supposed to come here. You're, you're, maybe you should touch him. This doesn't make any sense. And he's just like, believe me. It's like, okay, I'll believe you. I think the Lord sometimes does that with us. <laughs> just, do you believe his word? Do you trust him? When you're in a hard circumstance and you're like, everything's falling apart, do you believe all things work together for good? When you're in a bad situation and you want to get revenge, do you believe him when he says it's better for you to not get revenge and to leave it to him? When you're in a situation that looks like it's going to be terrible and you're anxious, and you, do you believe him when he says don't be anxious? Do you believe the peace of God which passes all understanding will actually quiet you and comfort you in those times? How many words from the Lord do we hear that we need to believe and act on and not doubt that his word is true? And how many times have you seen that when you believed the Lord, trusted him at your word, at his word, you found that in trusting him, you came through with stronger faith thereafter? I think we see here a model a bit in this man's life of trusting the Lord, though it didn't make sense, of believing the Lord, even though he wasn't sure it was going to, even though uh, some, some of us might doubt that it would work out, and finding that that belief was well-placed. Your belief in the Lord is always well-placed. He will show himself faithful. He's made a promise, he will keep it. We have so many around us giving us contrary words to Jesus' words about how we're to interact with our coworkers or how we're supposed to, uh, you know, make sure we don't let anybody forget wronging us and, 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 and that your life will be better if you just, you know, don't seek first the kingdom of God, seek first your own career and your own name. <laughs> We have so many contrary words out there. Will we believe the words of the Lord, seeking first the kingdom of God? Everything else will be added to you. Do we believe that? Will, will we act in faith? And again, we find that Jesus never lies, always shows himself faithful. We'll, we, we will find that if we put our faith in him, we have put our faith in the right place. One last point I would just want to uh, point to before we're done is that this man trusted Jesus as if his own son's life depended on it, didn't he? And it did, didn't it? <laughs> right? I, be I believe him as if my son's life depended. I, I can walk home believing because I, I, th I think me walking home and believing Jesus, I think, my, I think I'll find a, a living son when I get there. But I want you to encourage you to think the same way. You ought to believe in Jesus as if your life depends on it, because it does. You are trusting in Jesus for the salvation of your soul. You're trusting that if you, by, by faith, are united to Jesus Christ, you will be found righteous. Not a righteousness of your own that comes from your good works, but a righteousness that depends on faith. A righteousness that comes from Jesus Christ. It's not just this man who has to believe as if his life depends on it. It's us who have to believe as if our life depends on it. But again, I want to propose to you that there's no, no one you can trust more than Jesus with your life. So believe him. But I don't want you to limit yourself to believing him just for that salvation part of your life. I do think it's the most important. Believe him from every word that comes out of the mouth of God. Believe him for every promise that he's ever made every word of comfort he's ever spoken. He, does, he comes to you, yes, as a Savior, most importantly as a Savior, but he comes to you as the, your Lord and your Master. Will you believe every word he has to say? Pray by faith that we would do, do just that. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord God, for your word. Thank you for the way that we see Jesus pointing to the most essential thing, that is the salvation of souls. And yet Jesus 
graciously making promises and keeping promises. Jesus calling a man to believe and then strengthening his faith through that belief. So many helpful lessons that we can learn, Lord God. We pray that we would uh, have your spirit apply your word to our hearts today, that we might rightly respond with strong faith and believe everything you say. In Christ's name we pray, amen.